The TVR Tasman arrived in a flurry of hype at the beginning of 1980, but only really bloomed much later in the decade once its Ford engines had been replaced by some very interesting tuned Rover V8 units. Keith Adams tells the story of the car that pretty much defined the term Indian Summer. The mid to late 1970s were an exciting time for the British specialist car industry. A general feeling of optimism enveloped the industry, and exciting new models began to take shape. This recovery followed a slump in sales and manufacturing in the aftermath of the imposition of VAT on all kit cars and an energy crisis that affected the entire automotive sector. Over at Lotus, Colin Chapman had transformed the company from kit car maker and builder of low-cost and weight sports cars into a more serious company. The advanced-looking and far more expensive Jujaro Oliver Winterbottom triumvirate of Lotus's Sprit, Eclat, and Elite were in the process of transforming the fortunes of the Norfolk-based firm. Up in Blackpool, TVR owner Martin Lilly wanted to effect the same reboot on his company's model lineup and profitability. Throughout the 1970s, the M from Martin series cars had performed excellently for TVR. Introduced at Earl's Court in 1971, the M series cars were visually similar to their Grand Tour Vixen predecessors, but they were better engineered, more usable and more effectively screwed together. The cars were revealed on the Motor Show stand alongside those memorably nude models alongside the SM Zante prototype a car that looked to an even more exciting future for TVR and which hinted at a wedgier design language for the company. Intriguingly, in its contemporary Motor Show report, Car Magazine commented its shape is perhaps a little rectangular in plan, and there is an unhappiness about the triangular rear quarter windows, but altogether I was struck by the professionalism of the design both inside and out so much so that I pressed Lily hard in an effort to find out who was responsible. A friend was all he would say, implying that the friend actually worked for a rival manufacturer. He did reveal, however, that the molds were made by specialized moldings, the Huntingdon firm which was also responsible for Harris Mann's one-off Leyland Zanda prototype two years ago. Now I come to think of it. The appearance of the Zante at Earl's Court was a clear statement of intent Martin Lilly wanted to take TVR upmarket. At the show, hints were dropped that it was about to happen, with Carr stating be that as it may, the new TVR is scheduled for production, initially as a supplement to the present range, powered by the fuel-injected Triumph six-cylinder engine and selling for about the price of an Elon Plus II. As it happened, world events and the slow build-up of the M-Series cars were enough to scupper those upward plans, which was probably no bad thing. The M-Series cars would prove popular, and funded a period of modest but sustained growth at TVR's Bristol Avenue factory during the mid-1970s. The end of the kit car era. First to go on sale was the Triumph-powered 2500M in 1972, but it was soon followed by the Ford engine 1600M and 3000M. They also finally saw the end of the kit car era as, from 1973, it was no longer possible to buy your TVR unless it was fully assembled, the star of the range would prove to be the Ford Essex-engined 3000M, combining smooth performance and excellent dynamics. The range expanded, too. First came the Timar, which boasted improved practicality thanks to its opening tailgate, and then the broadspeed-engineered turbo of 1975 was added to the range. It was quick and capable, although not in the same ballistic league as the previous Griffith 200-400s and Tuscan V8 performance figures of the 230BHP car, were a 0.60 mph time of 7.2 seconds and a top speed of 139 mph importantly, rather quicker than the Lotus Esprit. The final and most significant M-Series evolution took place in 1978, when it lost the roof to become the 3000S convertible. It was this car, the first open top series production TVR that was the company's best seller as the 1970s drew to a close. With reasonable sales in the UK and overseas, and a loyal customer base, as well as financial strength the situation TVR didn't find itself in very often Lilly once again turned his attention to the important matter of taking the company up market with a much more modern looking car. The arrival at TVR of Stuart Halstead from Jaguar added impetus to Lilly's plan to produce something more expensive. He was a talented driver engineer with bags of enthusiasm for the company. And in August 1977, he and Lilly drew up plans for the brand new car. 
The name Martin Lilly chose was Tasman, a combination of Maserati Tamsin and a very pretty girl he knew at the time, Tamsin. The styling and body. Oliver Winterbottom was chosen as the designer to pen the 3000 M Timars replacement. Like Halstead, he was ex-Jaguar, having worked on the XJ6, the stillborn XJ21 and XJS, following on from his engineering apprenticeship. After leaving Coventry in 1971, Winterbottom moved to Lotus and became instrumental in Hethel's new design direction. He initially cut off the fins from the Europa, then penned the Elite and Eclat, before working with Giorgetto Giugiaro as the liaison engineer between Norfolk and Turin on the Esprit. In 1976, Winterbottom went freelance, and it was then that the relationship with TVR was struck up or may be re-established as he was also cited as a possible stylist for the SM Zanti above. Within a year of starting work on the Tasman styling, Winterbottom moved to Lancashire to establish a brand new design and engineering department at TVR. This was a considerable amount of work on top of overseeing the new car's styling, but by late 1978, the styling was emerging as exciting and a complete break from what came before. Bringing the 3000M up to date. Lillian Halstead briefed Winterbottom simply to produce a modern version of the 3000M Coupe that could also spawn a convertible should the market conditions prevail, leaving the talented stylist to really exercise his creative impulses. Given his work at Lotus and a long established love of the wedge, it was clear that the new car would be similarly influenced. Carr commented about the Tasman styling it is different, light looking sharp modern and excellent from some angles, terribly awkward from others, but when you run an eye and a hand around it and subject it to close scrutiny, always impressive in the design rather than the styling sense. The pillars, for instance, are thin, even fine, and so is the rear body outline. In profile and from the rear, it does little more than in close glass. Yes, that glass rear panel is inspired by the Espada and the Kamsen. In the TVR, it serves to enhance the looks greatly and make vision extremely good. Tasman styling works wonders. The awkward styling had one advantage, though. It was aerodynamic for its day with a drag coefficient of 0.36, job done for Oliver Winterbottom. The body itself was molded in two parts, Lotus style. The screen and cant rails were boxed using closed cell foam sections and marine ply impact beams were integrally molded into the front and rear. Windscreen, side and rear glass were directly molded to the body and the doors were fitted with side impact beams and considerable attention was paid to strengthen the sills and box sections. Once again, Lily and Halstead's brief was simple. The new car would have outstanding ride, handling and road holding. More importantly, it should be reliable to assist with sales in those all-important export markets. Like the M-Series cars, it would have a glass fiber body and would be underpinned by a welded-up tubular steel chassis. After all, this was a production method that worked well at Bristol Avenue, so why interfere with a winning system? There were no questions over the engine and gearbox either it was back to Ford, although with the long-lived Essex 3.0-litre V6 on its way out the common wisdom was that it had two or three years left, and so it proved the fuel-injected 2.8-litre Cologne V6 took its place. Carr stated at the launch of the Tasman a Rover V8, nothing like the service network available to the Ford V6 in Europe ironic, given what was to come. Icing heritage abounds. The chassis was designed by Ian Jones, a former engineer at Team Lotus, who was also partially responsible for the backbone of the Lotus Elana model of efficient, stiff design. In the Tasman, it was a welded-up tubular steel backbone that forked out at the front to enclose the engine and, at the rear, to accommodate the suspension pickups. At its center, the backbone was effectively a box section, with pressed steel covering the lower face. Twin perimeter frames span out from the central backbone to support the sills, the hinge structures, and the rollover bar. At the front, there was a fabricated sheet metal yoke to carry the suspension, while at the rear there was a triangular frame welded up from square steel tube which supported the differential and the lower suspension links. Like the earlier Lotus, the TVR Tasman was clearly a considered piece of engineering. Clever suspension. 
the suspension is a clever mix of off-the-shelf and proprietary engineering. At the front, the uprights, hubs and discs are lifted straight from the Ford Granada, while the lower links and wishbones are from the Quartina, as is the steering rack and spring damper unit suitably modified by Armstrong for TVR. At the rear, things were considerably more exotic, thanks to an arrangement that TVR claimed cost PS100008, the car to put together. The Jaguar differential was paired up with a Lotus-esque box section. Inboard discs were fitted and assisted reducing sprung masses. You look at all this and think it's so very different from the old TVR and wonder if it might just work like a Jaguar Lotus Cross and just how wonderful that might be an unusually effusive car commented. Clearly, this was the most thoroughly developed TVR ever produced. The first production cars rolled out of Bristol Avenue in November 1979, with the official launch at the Brussels Motor Show in January 1980. The Tasman was the first significant UK car launch of the 1980s, and certainly attracted its fair share of headlines. Again, car made the running, with a headline that screamed from the cover of its February 1980 issue, All New the TVR to make you buy British, and why it outshines even Porsche's brilliant 924 Turbo. On the road, the magazine certainly believed it was a class-leading sports car. In terms of handling it fizz, this is a car of tremendous capability, and it gives you so much of its capability so that you can motor so very quickly, so very close to its ultimate limits for such a lot of time. In conclusion, car continued on the same theme. And there is no doubt in our minds that TVR has achieved something worth shouting very loudly about in this new PS12800 car. It goes and handles like a pure sports car. It has the aplomb and the comfort of a grand tour. And that, in our estimation, is a highly desirable combination high praise indeed. Refreshingly familiar inside. The interior looked more inviting than the outgoing M-Series car, too no doubt to please the U.S. market for which this car was so clearly aimed at. But inside, our inline readers will be glad to hear that there was a huge amount of BL and Ford parts bin fixtures and fittings. Steering column and stalks were straight from the Princess, while the exterior door handles and rear lamp clusters were from the Capri MKE. The problem was that performance expectations were rapidly rising on the market, and the 160 BHP Tasman wasn't as quick as its price rivals. The fuel-injected Cologne V6 might have facilitated pan-European servicing, but it wasn't really capable of delivering scorching figures. The 060 MPH time of 8.0 seconds and 125 MPH maximum speed were acceptable, but hardly earth-shattering. What you end up with is another element of seemingly imperturbable character is how Carr politely described it. Hardly the stuff of dreams and not what TVR owners and enthusiasts were expecting. Tasman styling works wonders. The awkward styling had one advantage, though. It was aerodynamic for its day with a drag coefficient of 0.36. Job done for Oliver Winterbottom. The body itself was molded in two parts, Lotus style. The screen and cant rails were boxed using closed cell foam sections and marine ply impact beams were integrally molded into the front and rear. Windscreen, side and rear glass were directly molded to the body and the doors were fitted with side impact beams, and considerable attention was paid to strengthen the sills and box sections. Once again, Lily and Halstead's brief was simple the new car would have outstanding ride, handling and road holding. More importantly, it should be reliable to assist with sales in those all-important export markets. Like the M-Series cars, it would have a glass fiber body and would be underpinned by a welded-up tubular steel chassis. After all, this was a production method that worked well at Bristol Avenue, so why interfere with the winning system? There were no questions over the engine and gearbox either it was back to Ford, although with the long-lived Essex 3.0 Litra V6 on its way out the common wisdom was that it had two or three years left, and so it proved the fuel-injected 2.8 Litra Cologne V6 took its place. Carr stated at the launch of the Tasman a Rover V8, Nothing like the service network available to the Ford V6 in Europe ironic, given what was to come. Tasman range opens up. Bah. Ten months later, the convertible and 2.2 models were announced at the NEC Motor Show in Birmingham. Although these derivatives were developed in parallel with the coupe, 
Their introduction was delayed while the 100-strong workforce fully familiarized itself with the production of the new car. When it appeared, the 2-2 model was the most interesting because, although it sat on the same wheelbase as the two-seater car, there was more room at the rear, thanks to a shorter nose and longer tail, shuffling the interior room accordingly thanks to a relocated petrol tank and reprofiled roof. Style-wise, it benefited from the addition of flared arches and skirts. However, it was the convertible model which truly captured the buyer's imaginations in a roadster-starved market. It was, and is disarmingly handsome, with one of the most elegant hood mechanisms yet devised. Their stiff targa roof panel, which was held in place by a folding rear hood. Unfortunately, in the wake of the 1979 oil shock and spiraling fuel prices that severely stunted the sales of all luxury and performance cars, the Tasman sales proved disappointing, despite the addition of these new models. In the USA, where the Tasman was expected to do well, there had been an import problem which saw a consignment of cars to be snatched by the feds before they ever reached their customers, and the combination of both factors, along with the high development costs of the Tasman, did prove too much for Lilly. The creditors began to close in, as bills went unpaid, and just before he was forced to throw in the towel, Lilly handed the company to Peter Wheeler, a TVR fan and existing customer with more than enough money in hand to turn around the company's fortunes. Few people remember this, but the first car to be launched after Wheeler took control in 1981 was the Tasman 200, a 2-liter Ford Pinto-powered version, punching out 100 bhp. It might have seemed like the ideal car for a post-fuel shock economy, but the Tasman 200 failed to find popularity, selling a mere 61 copies before being phased out in 1984. All that was to change, though. Wheeler wanted more performance and was soon looking at ways of making the Tasman go quicker. After trying a turbocharged V6 two prototypes were built, he settled on Rover's all-aluminum 3.5-liter V8, which had performed so well for Morgan as well as BL's Rover and Land Rover products. A massive transformation. In fuel-injected form, the ex-Buick power unit pushed out a far more agreeable 190 bhp at 5280 rpm, and when installed in the lightweight TVR, it was capable of delivering electrifying performance. There was a political undertone for the decision to go with Rover. Two Middle Eastern markets were resistant to using as badged engines, ironic given the heritage of Rover's power unit. Despite limited visual changes, the Tasman underwent significant changes under the skin in its transformation into the V8-powered 350i. The space frame was widened by 1.5 in a change overseen by Chief Development Engineer John Box. Alongside this, the anti-roll bar was relocated, and the suspension was stiffened considerably. When the 350i hit the market in August 1983, the now-renamed 280i continued to be sold alongside, but it didn't remain in production for long UK and European demand died up almost immediately as the world fell in love with the new more powerful sports car. Rave reviews for the V8 Roger Bell, writing for Cars' September 1983 issue, was suitably impressed. He said, Acceleration is fierce, if not supercar fierce, though maybe it would be with full house power. With its experimental exhaust, the test car not only sounded like a dragster, it also took off like one. He continued, There are quicker accelerating rivals like the Lotus Esprit Turbo, for instance, but few get the adrenaline flowing quite so freely. Off the line, the Blackpool bomber is sheer dynamite. Figures alone tell half the story, but it was also the flexibility that impressed, floor the throttle when waffling in fifth at 700 rpm, and the rumbling growl of the exhaust hardens but doesn't falter. As the pace quickens more rapidly than the lazy beat suggests, there's nothing so rude as snatch or vibration to deter such apparent abuse. Bell concluded, imperfect it may be, the PS 14800 350 I gave me more undiluted motoring entertainment than any car I've driven since a Ferrari 275 GT before over a decade ago. Kink wings, who cares? In late 1984, the 390 Say with 275 bhp was unveiled, and the supercar establishment really did begin to look inwards. With a price tag of around PS 20,000, it was little more than the cost of a fully specced Porsche 944 
and yet with its new Andy Rouse-tuned 3905cc V8, the 390C was capable of 060 mph in 5.0 sex and could top out if you were brave at around 150 mph. The Torsen differential and uprated four-pot calipers did their best to harness the surfeit of power, as did the new sticky Yokohama rubber, but this was a car for skilled drivers and limited sales clearly proved this. However, the 390C was the mere entree because less than two years on, the 420C took the TVR Maxim for ultimate power and excitement to new heights. And the car, which was so specialist in nature it had its own area of the factory, was developed in-house during 1986 by TVR development engineer Chris Sherl. In case you're wondering, SEEK means Special Edition Aramid Composite and denotes that this car has a composite for additional lightness and strength, even if the first 20 cars were made from Kevlar, with the final 20 being made from regular glass fiber. Seek and ye shall find. Car Steve Cropley described the sea skyling politely to our eyes. It looks tasteless and overdressed, yet it doesn't miss being stylish by very much. Without the awful rear wing and more subtle, better integrated side skirts, the car could look very good indeed. Even beautiful. It certainly improves on the angularities of the standard wedge body. The TVR is certainly noticed and most people you meet are glad it's British. But many don't consider it grown up enough to justify its PS30,000 tag. That said, it was actually the way it went that really created the headlines for TVR. Cropley again the sheer thrust of the engine is breathtaking. You want to overtake someone? You just do it. Almost any gap is enough. As long as the engine is turning over 2500 RPM any gear is fine. Just 2,000 RPM is enough if you're in any gear below 4th. Accelerate with 4,000 RPM on the clock and your spine is thrust so far back into the seat that it threatens to fuse the sponge rubber solid. The C8, which has very good traction, rushes way past 40 mph in 1st, powers to nearly 70 mph in 2nd, having shattered 5.0 sex for 060 mph, reaches precisely 100 mph in 3rd, will show 140 mph in 4th and TVR says can do 165 mph in top. That bit we must take on trust, this is a privately owned car. 0 to 100 mph times of 12.0 sec, not much slower than the AC Cobra 427's time of 10.8 sec, seen within this car's province. But it delivers Ferrari speed and performance in a truly relaxed fashion. And missed opportunities. At the same time the Seek made its first public appearance in 1986, TVR unveiled the 420 Sports Saloon prototype. It was a clear development of the Tasman but extended into a 2 2 tour with rather unhappy styling. Peter Wheeler was never one not to listen to his customers, so when they gave it a thumbs down at the Birmingham Motor Show he left the car as a one-off. The Tasman wedge wasn't finished yet even if the Seek was too fast to race, and Peter Wheeler's own white elephant prototype one-off showed that there was life in the body. And even if the Holden-powered monster never made it into production, many of the styling tweaks that were introduced on it did as part of the 400 SE 450 Say restyle from 1988. Under the freshly rounded nose, its V8 was increased in size to 3948cc, and performance was just as vivid as before, but with improved high-speed stability to the end. In 1989, the larger engine 450C appeared, boasting an extra 45 bhp to take the total up to 320 bhp for supercar slaying acceleration. It was these later high-powered V8s that truly filled the gap left by those Griffiths and Tuscans from the 1960s, but also establishing the unfortunate Widowmaker reputation that would dog TVR to the end. These were truly legendary cars, and although the Tasman line would end in 1991, to be replaced by the retro-powered S Roadster, and then the Griffith undoubtedly the best-looking British sports car ever made, its standing among TVR enthusiasts remains undimmed. Indeed, even though it looked distinctly rocky following the promising launch, Peter Wheeler's astute creation of the V8-engined car rates alongside the creation of the EC Cobra as one of those truly special moments in British sports car history.